preached to us today. You're no stranger to us. You've been here in this pulpit many times. Praise the Lord for you and your ministry. Love you, brother. I love you too, brother. God bless you. Love you. Actually, I forgot to bring you something uh, this morning from Israel. You did. And uh, I love your tie. <laughs> well, I love your tie even better. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Actually, what I forgot to bring back uh, for the preacher is a uh, what was given to me. You know, I, there's a lot of perks for being a Bible teacher in Israel, uh, a tour host in Israel, teaching Bible prophecy to a group of people. Uh, that come with us, and I was given uh, three. I'm going to give you one of those three. And it is a 2,000-year-old Herodian oil lamp dating back to the time of Jesus uh, from the first century A.D. This one has a crack on the end of it, but it's an oil lamp from 2,000 years ago. So I forgot to bring it this morning. I felt the Lord wanted me to give it to you, so when we come back tonight, I'll present you with that 2,000-year-old uh, oil lamp. Uh, it's great to be a part of the missions uh, conference, and my ministry has various aspects to it. As the preacher said, I'm a Bible prophecy teacher. I teach Bible prophecy for its plain sense interpretation. But I also take trips to Israel four to five times a year. My wife and I just got back from Israel about, uh, what, three, three or four days ago. Okay, a week ago. I'm still getting over the jet lag, so excuse me. So uh, forgive me in that area. But uh, we led about 25 people over there, and I taught them Bible prophecy on location. But the other times I go to Israel is for Jewish evangelism. I'll be leaving for Israel again next month, October 24th, coming back on November the 6th. And this will be the 52nd Israel Gospel Outreach, in which I will be going there with a friend of mine, Dr. Todd Baker, he lives in Dallas. We're not going there with any tour groups. We're going there to evangelize. Amen. We're going there to share the gospel with the Jewish people. Some have said, well, why don't you just go and move over there? Well, God hasn't called me to do that. So if God hasn't called me, I'm not going to do it. When he calls me, I'll do it. Until then, I won't. I won't get ahead of the Lord. Amen? Amen. But I do go over there to share the gospel with Jews and with Arabs. Walking into shopping malls and... Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Elat, and the very southern point of the state of Israel, the southern tip of the state of Israel, Nazareth, uh, Tiberias. We walk into these shopping malls with complete Hebrew Bibles, Old and New Testament, Jewish gospel tracts. And we walk into these shopping malls going in and out of these stores, going one-on-one -on -one with Israeli Jews and with Israeli Arabs. Why? That's my calling. That's what God has called me to do as a evangelist slash prophecy teacher slash missionary to the Jewish people. So that is our calling. And it is a blessing to have our home church, East Bay Baptist Church, stand behind us as we do exactly that. Amen? So why do I go to the Jews? Because I want to see the Jews in the pews. But in order for the Jews to be in the pews... The Jews need to hear the good news. Chabesara <laughs> in Hebrew. You know, they were up here singing, uh, he's coming back or he's coming soon in various languages. But how do you sing that in Hebrew? Let's learn a little Hebrew this morning. Everyone say, who. who. Now that's H-U, not W-H-O, who. Who. Okay. Yagi. Bahrov. Okay, you got to have that. It's, it's B-A-R-C-H-O-V, but you got to have that Bahrov. So it's Hu, Yagi, Bahrov. He is coming soon. So you would sing it something like this. Hu, Yagi, Bahrov. Hu, Yagi, Bahrov. Who ya gi bak rov? Who you gi bak rov? He is coming soon. Amen. Can you sing that again? Oh, you want me to go through that again? <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Who ya gi bak rov? 
הוא יגיב אחרוב, הוא יגיב אחרוב, הוא יגיב אחרוב, הוא יגיב אחרוב. He is coming back. And that's the reason why I want to talk about this morning the importance of doctrinal integrity in the last days. If we're going to be sending missionaries, whether it's to Israel, whether it's to Portugal, whether it's to China, India, Indonesia, wherever, we need to make sure that who we support is doctrinally sound. Because we live in a day and age, and Tom and I talk about this a lot, we live in a day and age today where the church, by and large, has been infiltrated yep. with apostasy. Yep. And Christians are embracing every wind of doctrine that is out there today. We need to be careful who we send out there. We need to be careful who we support, because whoever this church supports needs to line up with the doctrine right. of East Bay Baptist Church. Right. And what is our doctrine? Well, number one, we believe in the Bible to be the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of the living God. Amen? Amen. Number two, this church uses no other Bible other than the King James Bible. So any missionary that we support must adhere to using the King James and the King James alone. Number three, we believe in Jesus' soon return. His pre-tribulational soon return. Any missionary that does not adhere to what this church believes, we can't support. I got a call from Brother Chris Baker uh, last Saturday, and he said, Brother Rosado, would you meet with us in, uh, in uh, Providence with the other preachers because we have a goal for 2023. Your name came up a few times here, Brother. We have a goal for 2023, and that goal is that we want to shower Providence, Cranston, Lincoln, wherever. We want to shower these areas with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with massive phone calls, uh, social media, uh, mail-ins, and things of that sort. We have the opportunity to do that. So all of us preachers got together uh, this past Wednesday, and uh, it was just a meeting of the minds, sharing the gospel. Why? I believe we're running out of, we're running out of time here. Amen. Time is of the essence. I believe Jesus Christ is coming sooner rather than later, which is the reason why we need to support missions, whether it's to Israel or whatever. We need to support missions. We need to send missionaries out there to share that good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because I believe a shofar, a trumpet is about to sound, amen? And the church, not the building as the pastor said, but the church is about to be taken out of here at this next event that we call the rapture of the church. So that's the reason why I believe the Lord gave me this message on the importance of doctrinal integrity. And I got to say, preacher, I believe we've lost that in the church today. Doctrinal integrity has gone out the window. I want you to take your Bibles. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. That's what I want to look at this morning. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Look in at verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul the Apostle is charging young Pastor Timothy to preach the word. That's what we need to be doing, folks, is preaching the word. That's not just limited to the pastor. That's not just limited to the evangelist or to the missionary. That is the job of every born-again, blood-washed child of the king. Amen? It is to preach the word. Notice what Paul said in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, looking at verse number 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and kingdom. Preach the word. You might want to highlight that, amen? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, 
exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come future tense I believe we're in that time right now for the time will come when they will not endure look at this sound doctrine what is sound doctrine sound doctrine is biblical doctrine preaching God's word for its plain sense interpretation because if the plain sense makes sense don't look for any other sense or you will end up with nonsense. And that's what we see going on in the 21st century church today. Doctrinal nonsense, fanciful suppositions, made up doctrines. There's no longer any biblical integrity in the church anymore. They will not endure sound doctrine, but notice this, but after their own lust shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Verse 5, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Oh, they're coming, whether we like it or not. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach the word in the last days in which we live lord prior to jesus soon return father we need to preach the word we need to stand behind missions to send missionaries out there to the nations lord who are doctrinally sound preaching sound doctrine so that we can plant that seed of the good news of the gospel of jesus christ in these last days in which we live father as we prepare just coming back from Israel, returning to Israel next month, October 24th, to carry out that 52nd Israel gospel outreach, going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as Jesus did in Matthew 10, 6, Matthew 15, 24. As Paul said in Romans 1, 16, that the gospel went to the Jew first and then to the Greek or to the Gentile. And Lord, I am... I am just blessed by the thought, dear Lord, that salvation is sufficient for all. Amen. But it's efficient for those who call upon the name of the Lord. And it is our job, Lord, in the 21st century in which we live, to take that good news, to go into all nations, teaching all nations, making disciples, Lord, to preach the gospel to every creature that's not limited that is unlimited and so father thank you for this opportunity help me to preach this message this morning be your brother uh, tom lord as he is little under the weather i pray that you touch and heal his body this morning and may you now be glorified in everything that is said and done for it's in jesus name we pray and all of god's people said amen, amen. and amen so we see here in second timothy chapter four paul the apostle is encouraging young Pastor Timothy to preach always, to be ready to preach the word, given every opportunity to do so. He is told to preach what? In season and out of season. What does that even mean, to preach in season, out of season? Oh, actually, let's put this on right here. We're trying out a new gadget for the church here. This was given to me by a church I preached that last Sunday. And so, uh, yeah, it looks like it's working just fine. So what does that even mean? To be instant, to be in season, out of season. Well, uh, to be instant means to be ready. Amen. Always ready to preach the gospel. Always ready to give a defense of what we believe and why we believe it. The word translated ready comes from the Greek word stand. In other words, standing by, always on duty. The Christian is never off duty. Amen. Amen? The Christian is always on duty. On duty for what? To preach the gospel. To give a defense of the gospel. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer of the hope, of the reason that's within you with meekness and fear. That word answer 
in 1 Peter 3.15 comes from the Greek word apologian, meaning a defense of the gospel. If you're in Bible college or in Bible school right now, you're going to take a lesson on apologetics. That's where we get that Greek word apologian, a defense of the gospel, what we believe and why we believe it. So he says in verse 2, preach the word, be instant, be ready, stand by, always on duty, amen, in season and out of season. It's interesting that uh, those words in season and out of season, the Greek words in season, out of season mean timely and untimely or convenient or inconvenient. We have the task to preach the good news in the last days in which we live. Amen. To Jew and Gentile whether you feel like it or not. Whether it's a timely or an untimely manner, whether it's convenient or inconvenient, we have the call to preach that good news to both Jew and Gentile. And that's the reason why out of the five times I go to Israel every year, three of those times is to take the good news to the Jewish people. You know why? They gave it to us first. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached by Jesus to the Jewish people. He said, I go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Before the gospel even went to the Gentiles, it went to the Jews first. And then it goes from the Jews to the Gentiles. So as I said, salvation is not just limited to the Jewish people. And it's not limited to those who call themselves the elect. I told you already, salvation is sufficient for all. What's my definition of all? A-L-L. -L. All means all. And that's all. All means Jesus Christ died for all, not some, all, Jew and Gentile. Salvation is sufficient for all, but efficient for those who call upon the name of the Lord. So we preach in season, out of season, in a timely or untimely manner, whether it's convenient or inconvenient. Well, I don't feel like supporting missions. That's not your call. That's a mandate that comes from God, that we support missions. Well, I don't feel like going soul winning. That, listen, it doesn't matter what you feel or don't feel. That's a mandate from God to fulfill the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So to be in instant means to be ready. Standing by, always on duty, in season, out of season, timely, untimely, convenient, inconvenient. We have the responsibility to preach the good news, whether we feel like it or not. And young Pastor Timothy here is prepared to engage in the actions Paul specified in verse number two. And that's simply three words, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Then he says this, rebuke, that's a strong word, man. Rebuke, reprove, exhort. What does it mean to rebuke? To expose someone's error doctrinal error what does it mean to reprove expose them for who they are what does it mean to exhort to encourage them but you do it with all long suffering you don't do it to be arrogant you don't do it to be nasty i see a lot of that among christians today arrogant nasty attitude you do it with all long suffering. You do it in the bounds of love with a Christ-like spirit. Amen? That's exactly what Paul is encouraging Timothy to do. So as we race toward the next event we call the rapture of the church in the last days in which we live, there will be a period, and I believe we're in that period right now, when sound doctrine will 
be rejected and replaced with error. 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come, notice the future tense there, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will reject sound doctrine. They will reject biblical orthodox doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We have a lot of that behind the pulpits of America today. Pastors, teachers, looking to tickle the ears of the congregation at the expense of biblical truth. Listen, when one preaches sound doctrine, he is preaching the God-ordained means to prevent defection from the truth. And today, we see a mass defection from sound biblical doctrine. We make things up, ladies and gentlemen, as we go along. I told you, in a nutshell, what is sound doctrine? Bible doctrine. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. Bible doctrine should be preached for its plain sense interpretation. Why? The Bible is its best own interpreter. And we just need to leave it as such. Stop making things up. Stop tickling the ears of your congregants. Preach what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And that's why we have a pastor that does exactly that, amen? Yes, amen. Him and I doctrinally are on the same page. And if he wasn't, I wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't be a member of East Bay Baptist Church. Or if I came in with some funky doctrine, he wouldn't have me as a member of this church. If I came in here with the heresy of Calvinism, you think he'd have me as a member of this church? Absolutely not. But yet Calvinism is destroying our churches across America today, even to the point of destroying families. I've seen that. Destroying. If it, listen, if that's from God, why is it destroying churches? If that's from God, why is it destroying families? If that's from God, why is it even destroying friendships? Something tells me that is not of God. Because the Bible says in John 3, 6, or rather Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. But even these guys go ahead and redefine words. Or oh, world, that means elect. Whosoever, that means just a few. Don't read the, you go to any secular dictionary and you'll see a total different definition from what these guys are giving you there. No one learns Calvin, I know I'm chasing a rabbit here, but nobody learns Calvinism by studying the word of God. You know how they learn it? They're taught from somebody else. Who were taught by somebody else. Who was taught by somebody else. Not from a plain sense interpretation of reading scripture. Doctrinal integrity, ladies and gentlemen, has gone out the window in the 21st century church today. The world doesn't even take us seriously anymore because of all of the doctrinal nonsense that's being propagated by, especially in the area of Bible prophecy. Doctrinal integrity within the 21st century church is absolutely gone. And that's the reason why when we support missionaries, we need to make sure that who we support is in line with the doctrinal statement of East Bay Baptist Church. And that's the reason why I've heard some horror stories from you, brother, about missionaries that were not even supported anymore, of how they took a 360 turn, man, and just, and just flown the coup. We need to be very careful. We have thrown out the baby with the bathwater in these last days in which we live. Christians have embraced every wind of doctrine out there today, especially when it comes to the area of what we would say um, eschatology. Is this thing going to transition for me now? Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. People, don't let that word scare you, by the way. Eschatology. (gasps) What does that even mean? (laughs) It just simply means the doctrine of last things. Bible prophecy in a nutshell. Definition of the study of the last times. Eschatos. 
last, pertaining to, being at the farthest boundary of an area, farthest, last, being the final item in a series, least, last, in time, all kinds of definitions here. The furthest extremity in rank, value, or situation. Last, last, least, most, and significant. The doctrine of the end times. The doctrine of what is to come on this earth. And it's not going to be pretty, ladies and gentlemen. When you read the books of Daniel and Revelation, it doesn't paint a pretty picture of what's going to happen to the nations of the world in the not-too-distant future, which is the reason why we need to get to the task of supporting missionaries and send the missionaries out there to preach the word. Whether in season, out of season, even to the point of rebu rebuke, reprove with all long-suffering and doctrine. Can you imagine being discipled by someone like Paul the Apostle. Oh my God. Here you have a first century rabbi, a first century Jew, who was a missionary, not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. But yet he had this, this desire in his heart to want to share the gospel with the Jews. So even though he was a missionary to the Gentiles, whenever Paul saw a synagogue, he was right in that synagogue. And what was he doing in that synagogue? Preaching Jesus Christ. That he is indeed the Mashiach ben David ben Abraham. The Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Every Shabbat, every Sabbath, on his way preaching to the Gentiles, hey, there's a synagogue, I'm going inside. And that's exactly what he did. He preached the gospel to the rabbis, to the Jews. They were in that synagogue. Peter was a missionary to the Jews. Paul was a missionary to the Gentiles. If salvation was just limited, why would these guys be going out to Jew and Gentile? Well, I don't know if God loves you. <laughs> I know he loves me. You know why? Because I'm the elect. Oh, by the way, that word elect is not just limited to the church. You know who else is called God's elect? Israel. Isaiah. 45.4. These guys do not know how to differentiate between the two. You have the national election of Israel, and you have the ecclesiastical election of the church. Neither usurps the other. Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. Yet these reformed guys fail to make that distinction, and doctrinal integrity whoop, goes right out the window. Eschatology. There is so much error within Christendom today. Error in the doctrine of soteriology. The doctrine of salvation. Well, that's just limited to us, not to everybody. Error in that. The error in eschatology. Even to the point of saying we're in the tribulation period right now. That's just ridiculous. If we're, if we're in the tribulation period right now, what are we under? The seal judgments? What are we under the trumpet judgments? What are we under the vial or the bold? What part of the tribulation are we in? And if, if we're in the tribulation period right now, then tell me when did recently 1.5 billion people just die worldwide? When did that happen? I don't care if you combine World War I and World War II together. Those numbers don't even come close to what we read in the book of Revelation. When did another 1.5 billion people die? 3 billion people altogether. When did that just recently happen? Again, doctrinal integrity, ladies and gentlemen, has gone out the window. Error in soteriology, error in eschatology, error in Christology. Jesus isn't God. He's not the creator of the universe. He never physically and bodily rose from the dead. He's a man just like you and I. Error in pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a force, like Star Wars. The force be with you. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. Could I lie to a keyboard? It's an inanimate object, isn't it? Could I lie to a chair? It's an inanimate object. Could I lie to a person? Well, then that brings me to Acts chapter number 5, when Ananias and Sapphira tried to pull a fast one. 
keeping back part of the proceeds from the land that they sold. And Peter said, Ananias, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You have not lied unto man, you have lied unto God. The Holy Spirit is not a force. It's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. You even got those in the church today that are denying the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know what they call that? They call that modalism. Uh, what's a modalist? A modalist denies God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Instead of saying there are three distinct persons of the Godhead, we say Jesus Christ is the embodiment of all three, without three distinct persons of the Godhead. T.D. Jakes and many just like him are modalists. They deny the doctrine of the... So there's, there's all types of error in all aspects of biblical theology here. Biblical integrity. It simply means studying the scriptures for their grammatical, historical, contextual, and very important, literal Amen. interpretation. In other words, you compare scripture with scripture. Preacher, you went to New England Baptist College. I'm sure you took a course in hermeneutics. I took a course in hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science of biblical interpretation. Who is speaking? Who is he speaking to? What is he speaking about? If you put that rule of thumb down in your personal study of scripture or Bible prophecy for that matter, you will notice that doctrine fits like a hand in a glove. And you will be able to avoid the hype, the fluff, and the sensationalism that's being propagated by those who are going beyond the scripture. Again, we look at 2 Timothy 4.4, 4. and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto what? So we're replacing biblical truth with fables, legends, myths, made up stories to replace the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of the living God. Now, I can understand the cults playing that game because they're cults. But I have a problem when Christians play that same game. Being turned to fables and turning away from the truth. Pastors behind the pulpits of America today are tickling the ears of the congregation. Rather than preaching the truth of God's word, we're turned to fables because we don't want to see those big tithers walk out the door. You got to be careful who walks into your door of an independent fundamental Baptist church. You don't do your homework on that individual. You just never know what they're bringing in, especially if they're coming from another church. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we see moral failure of man in the physical realm. And when you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 5, you will count 19 characteristics of the last days prior to Jesus' soon return at the rapture. Paul said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 5 shows man's moral failure in the physical realm. But then when we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, we see doctrinal failure in the spiritual realm. Moral failure in the physical realm, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Doctrinal failure in the spiritual realm, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in kingdom. That's future, that's eschatology, 
Preach the word in the present. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. That's my ministry. That's my full time ministry. Doing the work of an evangelist. Traveling around the United States, preaching, Jesus soon return. And when I preach Bible prophecy, brother, I want to do it responsibly. Amen. I don't want to be irresponsible. Let's play the game of uh, let's name the name of the Antichrist. Oh, I think it's this guy. I think it's him. I think it's him. I think it's him. It's absolutely ridiculous. Or making things up as they go along. Oh, there's going to be an alignment of these moons and da 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 da, -da fulfilling Revelation chapter 12. Or date set or whatever it is. It's an abuse. It's the abuse of Bible prophecy. And folks, we need to be very careful. Our problem today is that we get our doctrine from TV. Christian TV, for that matter. We get our doctrine from Christian TV. We get our doctrine from Christian radio. We get our doctrine from books. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, wrote, I just wrote a new book. By uh, uh, the political set in the States for the prophetic to be fulfilled. But don't substitute that for reading this book. That book may help you in some aspects, but this book will do you better. The B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the KJV, the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, amen? We can sing that one all day. Now, if you're going to watch Christian TV, I don't, I don't have a problem with anybody watching Christian TV. If you're going to watch somebody on Christian TV, make sure they're a biblicist. Make sure they are biblical. They're preaching sound doctrine whether it's Christian radio, or even if you walk into a Christian bookstore, for that matter. I can't even do that anymore. But if you walk into a Christian bookstore, make sure you get something that's going to be sound doctrine. Because the Bible says the time will come when they will not adhere to sound doctrine. That's exactly what we see going on right now. When somebody comes up with a new wind of doctrine, it doesn't take much for Christians to jump on the bandwagon. I just had my people, we were in Jerusalem last week, I had my people at the Temple Institute in the old city of Jerusalem. And everybody's blowing up my email, everybody's blowing up my Facebook messenger, hey August, what's up with these five red heifers? Well, what's going on with these five red heifers? Oh, they must be rebuilding the temple right now. No, they're not rebuilding the temple right now. There is no construction for rebuilding the temple. Sure, there's going to be a temple in the future, but there's no construction of a temple right now. And this Christian guy out in uh, Texas who bred these five red heifers and delivered them to Israel, he said, I'm fulfilling God's mandate for raising red heifers. God didn't tell you to raise red heifers. He told you to preach the gospel. And yet you got Christians today sending millions of dollars to the Temple Institute of Jews who reject Jesus as the Messiah, sending them millions of dollars to feed five red cows when that money could be used to support missions. Can you imagine, Pastor Tony, the money they're sending the Temple Institute to feed these five red cows this church could use to take on more missionaries? Oh, we've dropped the ball in that area. So we're, we're busy feeding five red cows rather than going out there and supporting missions, preaching the gospel to every creature. You see, we got to help God out here. Yeah. He's taking his time fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. He's just too slow. We need to help him out. So let's, let's, let's send millions of dollars to the Temple Institute so that they can feed these red cows, so that they can hurry up and rebuild the third Jewish temple. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. These guys out there looking to make a name for themselves, they want to think outside the box, come up with something new or some new doctrine or a new revelation, quote, unquote, to win people over. By the way, there's no such thing as modern revelation. Anybody who tells you that God has given them modern revelation, I'm just going to be blunt here. They're lying. 
The only revelation that you and I have today is what you're holding in your hand right now. That B-I-B-L-E. That's the only revelation that you and I have today. Anyone else says that God's given them revelation? You got to question that. A red flag should go off in your head. Lack of biblical integrity would include the abuse of Bible prophecy. Oh, the Bible doesn't mean what it says. Yeah, God says what he means. And he means what he says. They engage in spiritualizing scripture to fit their own belief, redefining words like the Calvinists love to do. They have no problem interpreting the first coming prophecies of Jesus literally. But for some reason, when it comes to the second coming, they spiritualize it and allegorize it to death. He's not coming back. What do you say to a person who tells you right to your face, Jesus is not coming back? How do you even respond to something like that? You respond with scripture. I'm going to wake some of you up right now. When someone tells me they don't believe Jesus is coming back, here's my response. Whoa, glory to God. I told you I'd wake you up. You're a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Well, what are you talking about? 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4 tells us that in the last days there will come scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You're a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. How does that even make you feel? Oh, they can, they'll interpret the first coming prophecies literally, but spiritualize the second coming prophecy. No rapture, no tribulation, no second coming, no millennial kingdom. All that is thrown out the window. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny his virgin birth like the Mormons do. His bodily resurrection like the ding-dong hall of the Jehovah's Witness do. They deny the rapture, tribulation, second coming, or even say we're in the tribulation period right now. These people should receive a PhD in imagination. They make things up as they go along. Are you with me? They make things up as they go along. We're almost done here. Lack of biblical integrity would include date setting for the rapture, claiming a person in power is the Antichrist like some U.S. president or prime minister of another country. I had a guy tell me at Brother Doug Connolly's church uh, two years ago that the, the vile person in Daniel 11:21 was Joe Biden. I thought Doug Connolly was going to fall off his chair, man, the pastor of the church. I said, are you serious? I said, why do you think the Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah? That eight-day celebration because of the vile person in Daniel 11, 21, who was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who desecrated the Jewish temple in 165 B.C. The Maccabean revolt, this priestly Jewish sect, overthrew the, uh, the, the Seleucid Empire. They regained their temple, found one day supply of oil. That one day, uh, day supply burned for eight days, thus the eight days of Hanukkah. Where in the world are you getting Joe Biden from? See what I mean? No longer any biblical integrity. I know it's laughable. No longer any biblical integrity. Folks, we've, we've thrown that out the window. Or others like Belgian computers are ready to take over the world. Jews are collecting rocks from a quarry in Indiana and bringing them over to Jerusalem to rebuild the third temple. Let me tell you something. Israel doesn't need to go to Indiana to collect rocks. There are no shortage of rocks in Israel. <laughs> the Social Security Administration is stamping people's hands. Any president with six letters in his first name, six letters in his middle name, six letters in his last name is the Antichrist. 666. Six, six. I'm going to shock all of you right now. My name is August Nelson Rosado. <laughs> My first name has six letters. My middle name has six letters. My last name has six letters. So I guess you can throw me in the group of Antichrist. No, I'm a born-again, blood-washed child of the king. All because somebody has 666 making up their full name, 
doesn't mean they're the Antichrist. Another weak argument. Again, lack of biblical integrity. Today in the church, we can care less about the coming of Jesus Christ rather than yearning for his soon return. You know what we're doing? We're yawning. Here we go, another prophecy message. Oh, Jesus is coming back. Don't yawn. Yearn for his soon return. Amen? He's coming back. We're too busy looking for the Antichrist rather than Jesus Christ and trying to guess who he is. Oh, my stars. No wonder the world doesn't take the church seriously anymore. Lack of biblical integrity. The abuse and misuse of Bible prophecy. We must restore biblical integrity back. That's the reason why Brother Chris Baker Amen. wanted to be with all of us preachers this past Wednesday. They asked me to preach on this March of 2023 at the church planting conference at First Baptist Church in Groton. I was just preaching there last Sunday. They said, August, I want, we, we need you to come to preach on restoring biblical integrity in the church. So in closing, how do we restore biblical integrity? Number one, we look at the scriptures for their plain sense interpretation. Amen? The Bible is its best own interpreter. We must apply inductive Bible study. That simply means you compare scripture with scripture in order to ascertain more information. We must avoid allegorizing the text unless the text itself tells you to do so. And if it doesn't, don't do it. Amen? And if you run into symbols in Daniel and Revelation, the Bible and the Bible alone will interpret those symbols for you. Not August Rosado or not some other prophecy teacher out there today. Here's another word that shouldn't scare you. We must exegete the scriptures. What does that mean, exegete? You draw the, amen? You draw the intended meaning from the text as intended by the biblical author. We must avoid Eisegesis. Do not put your own thoughts and your own ideas into the text. We must restore biblical integrity. Why? Jesus is coming back. And now, more like ever before, we need to stand behind missions. You were given a missions card. You take that missions card home and you pray over that missions card as to what God would have you to do to support missions. I think it's imperative. I think it's absolutely vital that we stand behind this preacher, this church, and sending out Bible-believing missionaries out there that are preaching sound Amen. doctrine. Because folks, prior to the rapture, and I believe the rapture soon, sound doctrine, Amen. biblical integrity has gone out the window. Even attacking the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Amen. For as a snare, Jesus said, shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. That's the unbeliever. But for the believer, look what he said. Watch ye therefore and pray ye always, that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The next main event, folks, that we call the rapture of the church. That's why when I travel across America, I love tooting my own horn. Amen. <laughs> I do. I like to toot my own horn. But it's in a good way, though. That's why I... I blow my shofar that I bought in Israel in 2010. And I blow the shofar. Everyone say shofar. Shofar, shofar so good. You're doing great. Your Hebrew's getting better. Your Hebrew's getting better. To remind us that one day a shofar from heaven will sound. Well, how do you know the shofar is a trumpet in the Bible? I just read my Bible. Joshua chapter 6, verses 4, 5, 6, 8, 13. Five times says the priest blew the trumpet of ram's horn. This is a Yemenite shofar. I have ram's horns uh, at home or actually in the car. And uh, when that shofar sounds, it will be so loud, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air.
Come up hither. And faster than you can blink the human eye. Out of here. Raptured. Taken out. Pre-trib. Pre means what? That's right. Before. That seven-year period comes upon this wicked, God-forsaken world. Jesus is coming back. But the question is, is he coming back for you? Every head bowed, every eye closed, and we'll be dismissed.